Hey friends, this is Michael Bohm with Youth Apologetics Training. Today we're going to keep going with this series on Islam and the Quran, and we're going to continue where we left off yesterday, where we were talking about witnessing to Muslims and various tips uh, that may help us when we're trying to lead our Muslim friends or family or co-workers to Christ. And so with that, let's go ahead and jump right in. By the way, I mentioned uh, your dress, you know, how you dress. A, a couple pointers here. Women. Uh, obviously, <laughs> in Muslim countries, the, the women have to wear these things called burqas. I mean, it's almost like a trash bag that they sling over the head of a woman and cut a little hole out for their eyes. And the point is that the, well, one of the points is that the woman's amazing figure that God has given them is not accentuated by the clothing. Hey, if you're going to be witnessing to a Muslim, uh, if you're going to be taking a Muslim to your home, where you have a wife or some daughters, or if you're a woman witnessing to a Muslim, you better think about the way you're dressed before you go out and do this. Because they're not going to be thinking, oh, wow, look at the amazing freedom that women have in Christ. They're not going to be thinking that way, at least not at first. They're going to be thinking, you filthy, ungodly, heathen, infidel, you know, <laughs> because of the way you're dressed. And then, of course, if they're a Muslim man, they're going to start uh, being tempted as well because they're not used to that. At least they may. Okay, they may be tempted. Anyway, w whatever, we'll pass by that one. Anyway, my point is be careful about how your wife and your daughters are dressed. Okay, another thing. Uh, Muslims see dogs as unclean. Same with cats. So if you invite them in your home, don't, don't be offended if they take an immediate disliking to your animals. Uh, it is what it is, guys. In fact, if you can, you might want to keep your animals away, whether you kennel them or whatever. Um, keep them away if you can, but don't be offended. On that same note of uncle uncleanness, uh, keep in mind that they're very observant of the Old Testament dietary laws for the most part. In other words, don't try to feed them pork. <laughs> Keep all forms of pork out of their sight. Uh, no shellfish, stuff like that, okay? If you have any questions about what's clean and unclean, you can pretty much look at the Old Testament dietary laws and that will help you out. Stick with what is obviously clean to them, okay? Stick with these obvious things. Uh, avoid boxed foods because a lot of those boxed foods have uh, strange ingredients that actually go back to pork. Um, I don't get too legalistic about things. My family and I, we actually do avoid pork, but it's more for health reasons than anything. But you know, when you look at the ingredients of a lot of the boxed food, I mean, it, it, it gets pretty insane just how much pork gets snuck into food. We honestly don't care as a family. It's like, okay, we're not going that far. We're, we're just not. We're just avoiding, you know, some yummy bacon or pork chops or ham, which I still love and I wish I could have. But honestly, I just don't like the things I've read about it as far as health, whatever the case, okay, all that to say, be mindful of that. Be very mindful of that. If you're going to cook them food, really think that through before you start cooking. Really think it through. Make sure you're not offending them in any way. The gospel is offensive enough. By the way, keep in mind too, this is not something when you're witnessing, it's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to just be standing there witnessing, witnessing to somebody on the street corner and this Muslim's just going to fall on their knees and, and receive Christ. Not unless, okay, not unless somebody else has been working on them or something happened, but most likely it's going to be a friendship evangelism type situation where you're going to be talking to them for a long time and uh, repeated visits, okay? And so you want to preserve that friendship. So, yeah, again, 
being mindful of these different things that offend Muslims. If it's a Muslim that lives in the same country as you, uh, like if you live in the United States and it's a, an American Muslim, they're going to be a little more receptive to a lot of the American culture because they've been here for a while. But still, go out of your way to show them respect. They will see that and they will respect you in return. Okay? Another thing I read, um, actually, some of the things I'm sharing with you, I found in Ron Rhodes' uh, Reasoning from the Scriptures with Muslims book. By the way, I mentioned it at the beginning of the series, and it's just awesome. Pretty much all of his books in this uh, Reasoning from the Scriptures series, they're all amazing. I own four of them, and they're, they're just really well done. They're well organized. But anyway, another point he made, I've never heard this before. But I thought I'd mention, um, be aware that eye contact, uh, especially like really intense eye contact, is actually something that Islamic culture is, it, they're not really used to, and they, they uh, see it as offensive if you're really looking them in the eyes all the time. If you, you know, if you're witnessing to a Muslim here in the United States, chances are they're used to it. It's not going to bother them at all. But if you notice them looking down a lot or not making eye contact as much, chill out, okay? Then just roll with it and don't look them in the eye as much and kind of look around the room as you're talking to them, whatever you got to do. Okay, I just thought I'd throw that in there. I guess let that, you know, just fill that out, okay? Another point, avoid being overly critical of Islam. All right, there's a fine line that you, the Christian, are going to have to walk. Because you're going to have to present the truth, um, but you don't want to be offensive. Okay, don't go into this thing telling them that their God is a devil, and he's, he's the devil moon God, and, uh, and then burn a Koran in front of their face and take a bite out of a hot dog. Okay? <laughs> okay? Uh, you don't want to be overly critical. You don't want to be... Uh, just trashing their Koran, trashing Mohammed, because you know what? Just about any other faith is the same way. They're going to shut you down. They're not going to want to hear what you're saying. All right? So, again, it kind of goes back to be humble and do this in love. All right? Just take your time and present the truth in love. Don't go in there guns blazing right away. All right, this is something when you're sharing critical points, you uh, do it with tact, okay? Be tactful. And on that note, having just said that, um, don't be too much of a pansy either. <laughs> and what I mean by that is if you're too weak-wristed, if you're too um, uh, submissive and you give up too much ground, they're going to interpret that as uh, I'm winning. And in a Muslim's mindset, that will encourage them to push even harder. All right. So you, you be firm, be firm in your stance, but don't be overly critical. All right. So now maybe let's, let's start getting into some meat and potatoes here. We've kind of talked about tactics. Ooh, tactics. Yes. Ha. Okay. Wow. That just, popped up there. All right, tactics. If you guys have read Greg Kokel's book on tactics, there's a couple questions. Uh, he, it's amazing. It's an amazing book that teaches you how to uh, speak with just about anybody about your faith in a very non-offensive, friendly way. And it even teaches you how to deal with talking to people even when you don't really, sometimes you don't even know what you're talking about. But here's the thing. Here's a few of the questions that are shared in that book, Tactics, by Greg Kokel. Some of the questions that I rely on literally just about every single day. One, what do you mean by that? Okay, if they say something like, the Bible's corrupt, what do you mean by that? Jesus is not the Son of God. Well, what do you mean by that? Um, Jesus is just a prophet. Well, what do you mean by that? All right, you always want them to clarify their position. What do you mean by that? A lot of times people don't, don't know what they mean by that. Uh, most Muslims you talk to, they probably will, but that's okay. Second question, how do you know that? 
Now you get to the meat and potatoes. Now you're going to find out if they really have a reason or not. And you can grapple with those reasons and work with them and try to find out if they're true or not. But when you ask somebody how you know that now the ball's in their court to prove to you or convince you at the very least that they're right. Okay. And then thirdly, and this one's far more difficult, um, check out his book, Tactics, if you want to learn more about this. But you ask leading questions that help you lead them to the answers that you've already reached. You're trying to help them uh, find a true conclusion. You know, you're, you're trying to ask them questions that are get, they're going to bring them to the truth without putting the truth straight in their face and saying, this is what it is. All right. So anyway, I'll eventually do a series on it because I, I just, I love what Greg Kokel did there. He's got his printed copy. He also has an audio book version, although I, I hate to say it, guys. I bought both. The guy that narrates the audio version of his audio book has got to be the worst audiobook narrator I've ever heard. But anyway, <laughs> I've listened to a ton of audiobooks, and that is by far the worst narrator job I have ever heard. It's still worth buying. I'll just tell you that right now. But there will be times when you'll be gritting your teeth, like you've got to be kidding me. Where'd they find this guy? Anyway, um, <laughs> oh, sometimes I can be offensive. Anyway, um, now that I've gone down that rabbit trail, we're going to look to try and find common ground between you and the Muslim, if you can. Okay, again, we're looking for a relationship, you know, friendship-driven evangelism type situation that you can take slowly over time. All right? If you want to do this quickly, this is your, your one shot at getting them saved, you're still going to find a lot of stuff that you can glean from the different points we're going to cover today. But chances are you're taking this slow. This is a friend. This is a neighbor. This is somebody you work with. This is somebody you know. So you want to find common ground. All right? Muslims believe in the God of the Old Testament. All right? That doesn't mean we worship the same God. Okay? I'm not saying that. I can't stand that when Christians like, if you can even call them a Christian, people like Rick Warren, that say, we all worship the same God. No, we don't. No, we don't. But they believe in the God as portrayed in the Old Testament. They just add to so many things to his character. It's no longer him anymore. But you can find common ground there, okay? I'm not talking about compromising, my friends. <laughs> I'm talking about just reaching a starting point. Okay, so we both believe in this God as portrayed in the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the law. Okay? They also believe that Jesus was a great prophet. All right? That's common ground. We also believe that Jesus was a prophet. We just believe a whole lot more. <laughs> but again, we're trying to find common ground here. They also believe that Moses was a great prophet. So do we. All right, so we're, we, we try to find places where you do agree and then work from there. Now, they, um, in the Quran, in multiple different places, the Bible is actually uh, elevated as the Word of God, okay? We're talking, and, and by that I mean uh, the first five books of Moses, so the Torah, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. Oops, I said them out of order, whatever. Um, <laughs> and um, also the Psalms, the Prophets, and the New Testament. Okay, here's the deal, though. They believe that parts of the Bible have been corrupted. And we'll deal with that in a minute. Um, but what I'm trying to say is, in multiple spots in the Quran, the Bible is elevated as God's Word. Okay, so that there, again, is common ground. Yes, they're going to say the Bible has been corrupted. I guarantee it. 
they're going to tell you the Bible has been corrupted. There's so many ways to deal with this. All right. Uh, by the way, check out my series on the evidence for the divine inspiration of the Bible. That's kind of one direction you can take. Another one uh, is to talk about the reliability of the Bible. And I, at to date, do not have too much material on that subject. I plan on getting very down and dirty on that very soon. But by that, I mean you can talk about things like... Um, the manuscript history of the Bible. Talk about things like the Texas Receptus and how we've got over 5,000 manuscripts that pretty much say exactly the same thing. The only major real differences we have is the spellings of names, of people, uh, cities, uh, silly stuff, trivial stuff. No doctrines are in question. We're talking about over 5,000 manuscripts. We have uh, some... I'm going from memory here, guys. Don't quote me on this, but somewhere around 10,000 different uh, church lectionaries, lection, uh, uh, lecture notes, basically, from early church church services. We have uh, church songs that we can refer back to and find solid Christian doctrine from it. We have over 20,000, I think it is, different translations from, from early early Christian translations into different languages of the surrounding nations and cultures around Israel at that time. And they all say the same thing. So yeah, you, I, I fully intend on doing many series, different series on, on different topics like that. But in the meantime, there's plenty of books out there, different books talking about, for example, again, like the book of Acts, and the book of Luke, and how historically minded Luke was, trying to ground his gospel and the book of Acts in history, and recording all kinds of different things that were going on, all the extra biblical evidence that what we find in the gospels is actually what happened, uh, different claims like for example, the book of Talmud, the, I'm sorry, the Talmud, the Jewish Talmud, and how it talks about Jesus and how he was a miracle worker, uh, only they attribute those miracles to witchcraft. We have all of these different things that show us the reliability of the scriptures, Old and New Testament. All right, we, we can bring them to that evidence, that kind of stuff. And you know, again, we're, we're just having a conversation with them. We're loving on them and we're talking about things concerning the Bible. But here's something else. This is a little bit rough, okay? This is a um, great question to be asking them because they'll, they'll make a claim that the uh, Bible has been corrupted. But here's the question then, okay? Because the Koran was written around 600 A.D., so you can ask him the question, if the Bible was corrupted before Muhammad and the Koran, then why does the Koran say that Muslims should go to the Bible for guidance and light? Okay, because the Koran does say that in various places. Muhammad made that claim. Again, he, he endorsed the Bible as a source of truth. Okay, as the Word of God. All right, so again, these corruptions, if they came before the time of the Quran, why would Allah, through Muhammad, say anything encouraging or positive about the Bible, the Word of God? Okay, if it happened after then why can we go back and check manuscripts before and after the time of Muhammad and find that they match? So you see what I'm saying here? If these corruptions happened before, why did Muhammad and Allah, for that matter, endorse the Bible? If these corruptions happened supposedly after, then why can we take later manuscripts of the Bible and compare them to earlier manuscripts and find the same thing? Great questions. 
let them think about that. That's, I mean, that's good stuff. Tomorrow we'll keep going and looking at more tips when trying to, or ways that people have found success when witnessing the Muslims. And so with that, come out to the website, youthapologeticstraining.com. And there, guys, you can leave comments and questions. I do want to talk to you guys. Also, you can catch me on Google+, Plus, Facebook, and Twitter. And with that, I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow.